this chapter, we will start looking at how cells divide. Now, dividing of a cell is important, of course, in cell repair and important in the development of an organism as related to reproduction. The information that controls this process, of course, is going to be present in the DNA itself. Remember, in chapter 13, we discussed the DNA molecule. We introduced the concept of the genetic code. So let's look at the process of, ce of cell division, but we will start first with a look at uh, some key uh, components of DNA and uh, cell of DNA replication. Let's see how genetics, which is the DNA, and the genes that may, that are present in the DNA molecule. Uh, let's look at the genetics and see how that relates to cell division. One of the important principles in all biology is illustrated in something that we refer to as the central dogma of all biology. DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein. Now the DNA molecule has the genes which control the information that is necessary for making a given protein. Now the protein molecule is, is produced and carries out the various functionalities of a cell. So DNA, which has the genes, transfers that information to the process of transcription to RNA. The RNA molecule carries that information to the appropriate place within the cell, and their protein is made. So DNA goes to RNA, and RNA goes to protein. So genetic information is passed from cell to cell and from parent to offspring through this process. So let's review some key terms that I think are important for us, for us before we go forward. Okay, remember, nucleotides consist of phosphate groups, uh, sugar, and bases. We have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine nucleotides. All nucleotides make up the double-stranded DNA molecule. Remember, the DNA molecule is a heliclone structure. Uh, it is quite complex. Next, messenger RNA. The messenger RNA uh, is the product of transcription. Next, we'll look at transcription, of course, is the process by which DNA copies itself into a messenger RNA. Translation is the process by which the messenger RNA then is translated into a protein. Replication, of course, is the process by which DNA will make more of itself. Now, when you use the term genome, we are referring to the entire uh, DNA complement of an organism. For example, we talk about the, the genome of a bacteria, the genome of a, of a virus, the genome of the human. The genome of the human, for example, will have 30,000 functional genes present, quite complex, whereas the genome of a bacteria may only have uh, two or 3,000 genes and the genome of a virus may only have five genes. Genes, of course, a good definition for gene is, the, is, the, is a piece of DNA that will code for a given protein. Therefore, gene, protein, and those two go together. Now, all of our uh, DNA is, is packaged in little bodies that we see when a cell divides, and these are called chromosomes. So a chromosome is a complex network of genes uh, complexed with proteins, 
and we can see them as small, little, visible bodies only when a cell is in a process of division. We'll, we will talk more about each of these uh, concepts as, as the need arises. So, let's look at our DNA molecule. Of course, the DNA structure has four nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Uh, and you can see it's a double helix structure. Adenine will always combine with thymine, and guanine will always combine with cytosine. So one basically is a complement, is a complementary strand of the other. Now let's see how the central dogma works with a little model that we're looking at right now. Remember, DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein. Let's let's pick the model of insulin. And insulin, of course, is a very important protein that is produced in the, in the pancreas. Uh, the gene for producing insulin would be present in the DNA, in the nucleus, in the DNA of the nucleus. Now, let's say that a cell has to need some insulin. A signal would come to the DNA in the pancreas nucleus. The signal would direct the gene for making insulin to expose and open itself up. It will unwind, and just a piece of information that's necessary for making insulin will open up. And as it opens up, one part of the DNA strand is copied into a molecule called messenger RNA. Now, this messenger RNA basically has the information necessary for making the appropriate protein insulin. This messenger RNA, as you can see in the yellow strand, is now moved outside the nucleus through nuclear pores into the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, the messenger RNA will bind itself to something we refer to as a ribosome, which is basically a protein factory. As the messenger RNA binds itself to the ribosome, the ribosome is able to read that information on the messenger RNA, and through the process of translation, it will translate that information into a protein molecule. The messenger RNA leaves the nucleus, goes into the cytoplasm, and attaches itself to a ribosome. Now, ribosomes are actually protein factories. As the messenger RNA hooks itself to the ribosome, the ribosome is able to read the information on that piece of RNA that tells it to make a given protein, in this case, insulin. Remember, a protein is determined... <clears throat> A protein is determined by the sequence of amino acids that are present. Now, the information on the messenger RNA tells the ribosomes exactly what amino acids are to be put together in what order. We will spend a lot more time on this overall process, but this is the essence of it, is that the information is transferred uh, to uh, Proteins And the protein now is insulin, and the protein has all the amino acids in the right sequence, which is determined by the gene which was initially present on the DNA. So now let's look at chromosomes. Now chromosomes, as we said before, are, is, are structures in the nucleus of, the, of eukaryotic cells. Chromosomes are small bodies that you see when a cell divides. It is made up, of course, of DNA plus protein. Now, the DNA in chromosomes will have thousands of genes. Uh, a, given, uh, uh, a given chromosome in humans may have four to 5,000 genes. Each gene is made up of hundreds of nucleotides. And each gene, of course, will direct a single protein production, like the example we just saw before, where a given 
gene for insulin directed the production of the molecule insulin. Now, in eukaryotic cells, all chromosomes will exist in pairs. If we want to see chromosomes, we have to take cells and stain them in the right phase of cell division. And when we do so, we get a karyotype, which is a visible display of chromosomes. So I've given you a lot of material, so let's go forward and see how all of this falls in place. Okay, let's first of all, let's look at what chromosomes look like. If, if you can see to the right, we have a cell with four chromosomes. One, two, three, four. Okay. Each chromosome, if you look carefully, is made up of two chromatids. Now, we are looking at a cell that is in a process of division. So in preparation, this, the chromosomes have to double themselves. The DNA has to double in preparation for cell division. So we're looking at four chromosomes, but each chromosome is already preparing itself for division. So therefore we have four chromosomes, but we have eight chromatids. Okay, so now looking at the chrome, but we still look at a pair of chromosome, a chromatids as a chromosome. So looking at the, starting from the right, we'll look at these two chromatids, and if we, if we can unwind this, we can see this string-like, complex, rope-like structure that is embedded with, with proteins that hold it together and twist it around. We see we unwind it, and what do we get? The DNA molecule. So this just shows you the complexity of a chromosome. And of course, this particular chromosome will have lots and lots and lots of genes. So, in the process of cell division, the first thing that has to happen is the, the DNA has to double itself, or the chromosomes will actually double into chromatids. So, what happens first is the DNA, as you can see starting from the top, will replicate. It will replicate to form two DNA molecules that are identical. Now, once this happens, a cell will, will then undergo a process we refer to as mitosis, which is nothing more than a separation of the DNA molecules that we see that have replicated. So now we have two cells with two identical DNA molecules. Now, the next process that takes place in cell division is that is the process of cytokinesis, where the, rest of the, where the rest of the material in the cell is divided. Now, those, that material would be mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, proteins, and various things that are necessary for the functionality of the cell, and eventually you end up with two new cells. So you can see, we start off with one cell, the cell DNA doubles, the, the, the DNA breaks apart into two separate parts, which, is, which falls into the process of mitosis, and finally, the rest of the, of the material gets separated, and we get two cells that have the identical components of DNA. So this is what happens during the process of cell division. So let's look again as to what is going on during, during this process of cell division at the DNA molecule. The first thing that happens is the DNA has to replicate. Now, this process occurs by the DNA unwinding, and each strand will now make another copy of itself. So you end up, as you can see, with two new double-stranded molecules of DNA. To see how this correlates with a chromosome, let's see, let's look at a chromosome, a single chromosome. Now, I'm showing you a single chromosome, but in reality, you can never see a single chromosome that looks the way I'm showing you to the right. But for illustration purposes, okay, we can see we have a single chromosome, 
and when the cell is ready to divide, that chromosome will form two chromatids. Look to the left and see what is really happening. To the left, you can see that the DNA is going through a process of DNA replication. And as you can see, DNA replicates, forming two molecules, and to the right, we end up with two chromatids. But still, when you see an X structure like that, that is not an X chromosome. That is one chromosome that consists of two chromatids. And you will only see this. You will only see a chromosome during the process of cell division. This illustrates my point. To the left, we're looking at a cell. We're looking at a cell nucleus and a DNA protein within the cell nucleus. Do you see any chromosomes there? I don't. All I see is a complex web of DNA proteins all kind of interwoven like a bowl of spaghetti. But, but the chromosomes in principle are there. But this is a cell that is not yet ready for, divi for division. Now, once the cell starts to go through the process of dividing and preparing, for, I should say, once a cell uh, goes through the process of preparing for division, you can see what happens. The chromosomes, by sheer uh, cell magic, start to form a little bodies. And now you can see that during the process of division to the right, we are seeing one, two, three, four, five separate chromosomes. Each chromosome, as you can see, has, div has formed two chromatids, each identical to the other. So let's now look at, since we know where chromosomes are, of course, they're present in the nucleus, uh, we can now... Uh, get an appreciation for what a karyotype is. So if I was to take some cells from a human during the process of cell division and stain that cell and look at all the uh, for forming chromosomes, I would get what is referred to as a karyotype. The human will have 46 chromosomes. And chromosomes are present in pairs. As you can see, we got chromosome 1, chromosome 2, all the way through chromosome 22, and then we get the X and Y chromosome. We'll get to that in a moment. But I'm looking basically at a karyotype, which is a pictorial view of the chromosomes that are present in humans. Now, each chromosome, it will, each pair will be different. As you can see, uh, number one looks quite different from number three, six looks quite different from, from 15, and so on. Each, of the pair, each pair is referred to as a homologous pair. Uh, each pair consists of a chromosome that had come from, one had come from the mother, and one had come from the, from the father. So, so all of us are made up of every cell in our bodies consists of 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, one of each pair have, had come from our parents. Uh, another important point to mention is that when you look at chromosomes, especially to the bottom, you see that the human karyotype has an X and a Y chromosome. So therefore, that's not a true pair. The X, chrome, X and the Y chromosome means, of course, a male. Two X chromosomes would be a female. So it's important for us to understand and be able to interpret uh, and, and clearly uh, 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 appreciate what a carrier type is. So now let's go back to the process of uh, DNA replication and cell division. Again, a cell gets ready to divide, the DNA divides into two identical uh, molecules. Mitosis takes place, two DNA molecules uh, will split into two new cells. Cytokinesis, two new cells are formed. So now let's put this into a broader perspective, into what we refer to as the cell cycle. The cell cycle in eukaryotic cells. 
Remember, we're dealing with eukaryotic cells, cells that have a nuclei and a complex uh, organelle and structure and so on, as opposed to a prokaryotic cell. So if we look at the cell cycle, we can break it down into three parts. One is referred to as interphase. The second is mitosis. And the third part is cytokinesis. As you can see, the interphase is a very, very long period. Mitosis is the, cell, is the division of the DNA, and cytokinesis is the final separation of the cell into two distinct cells. Uh, as you can see, if we start from the top, let's see what really happens during this cell cycle process. Let's look at a, a fresh cell that has just been formed. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to the, to the top of your slide. At the end of cytokinesis, we have two new cells. The cell, one cell now goes to, through the uh, interface state. During the interface state, called G1, the cell is basically increasing a mass, uh, kind of maturing, and so on. It goes through a growth phase. Now, when it finally gets towards the bottom, it goes to an S phase. Now, before it gets to that S phase, that cell has to make a decision. Am I going to divide? Am I going to die, and some cells die? Or am I going to stay exactly where I am? Some cells do not divide. For example, muscle cells do not divide. Uh, 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 nerve cells don't divide, where skin cells, liver cells divide rapidly. So, as we're looking to the bottom, we're moving towards the S phase. A decision is made by the cell to divide. So we go to the S phase, which is the synthesis phase. What do you think we're going to be synthesizing? What we're going to be synthesizing is DNA and other proteins. So what happens is, as you can see, the cell moves into the, into the uh, uh, synthesis phase. We're still, we're still in interphase. We're moving into the S phase. The cell now doubles its DNA which means that the chromatids have now been formed. All the chromosomes now, if you look at them, will be in, will be in the phase where you can see the individual chromatids. Now the cell will go into the G2 phase, where it's really starting to accelerate preparation for division. Proteins are produced, lipids are produced, and all the important things that will be necessary for cell division. Then we finally get down to the point where mitosis will take place. Remember, my, mitosis is the vision of the DNA of the cell or the chromosomes of the cell. So the cell chromosomes now will split in two. Each cell, each new cell will have identical new chromosomes. And finally, we go through a very short phase of cytokinesis where the rest of the material is evenly divided into two new cells. So again, in the cell cycle, we have interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. We start with a given component of DNA, and we double that, and we, we, and we end up with two new cells. So now let's look at the important details of how mitosis and cytokinesis takes place. We will start with, with a cell that is in, at the end of interphase. At the end of the interphase, we're looking at a cell. Uh, the DNA is not quite yet visible, but the DNA is, is probably doubling. Uh, we can see pairs of centrosomes that are being formed to the left. And let's now move into the first important uh, phase of mitosis called prophase. We're going to be looking at prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And it's a good uh, division as to what is really happening uh, uh, during the process of mitosis. Uh, keep in mind, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase is an artificial 
uh, distinction that we put in place just so that we can we can study we can study the process. Uh, in reality, it's a continuous process, and it's sometimes difficult to distinguish between prophase, metaphase, and metaphase, and anaphase, and anaphase, and telophase. So let's look at prophase. In prophase, as you can see, uh, we can now look at a cell. And you can look at, at, the, at the artist's illustration, and on the bottom you can see uh, an, an actual uh, animal cell uh, and what the nuclei looks like. You can st- in prophase, you can start to see the chromatids and the chromosomes very distinctly, okay? So in, in this case right here, I'm looking at a nucleus. The nucleus has one, two, three, four chromosomes. And each chromosome already has divided itself into two chromatids. To my left, we see a spindle fiber complex. That's going to be used to pull the chromatids apart. Now we go to the second phase called metaphase. And metaphase is quite simply... All the chromosomes, each chromosome, will line up along the equator of the cell, and the spindle fibers will attach themselves to the chromatids, and and let's go to the next phase. In anaphase, we can see that the chromosome is now getting separated, so that you have, in anaphase, you have separation. Chromatids are pulled apart towards the respective pole, and finally, in, in this particular slide, you can see what's going on in telophase, and, it, and we are combining telophase and cytokinesis on the same slide, unfortunately, but basically what's happening here is in telophase is just an extension of anaphase where the chromosomes are pulled apart into their respective cells, and finally, more and more material also gets split between the two cells, and you end up, as you can see, at the end of cytokinesis with two cells. The two cells are going to be identical, and eventually, if you look carefully, you no longer can see individual chromosomes. They become diffused into a complex uh, network and you can see now to the right, the process begins all over again. So again, uh, if you will look at this illustration carefully uh, and, and in the laboratory, you will, you will clearly see this process work uh, uh, under the microscope. So you go through the process of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. The end product are going to be two new cells that are identical or the same genetic information. And here is an illustration of a cell that's in the process of cell division. In a plant cell, the process is a little bit more complex because you have to form a cell wall. Remember, a plant has a cell wall, whereas a uh, animal cell will not have a cell wall, but only a membrane. So therefore, as you can see, the process of the formation of the cell wall is a little more uh, it's a little more intricate, but it's quite easy to understand if you study this illustration. Now, the process of cell division for a prokaryotic cell is quite simple and quite different. A prokaryotic cell, if you remember, is a bacteria. The bacteria will have a one. I'm sorry. The bacteria will have one circular chromosome. Now, when a Bacteria divides, the, the, the single DNA chromosome will double itself, as you can see, to the right, and eventually simply form two new cells with two new circular DNA, DNA molecules. We don't have this concept of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and all the things that go with that, but simply a, a binary fission, as you can see, a simple division of a cell. But first, the DNA must always replicate to form two new molecules. We have looked at the cell cycle, and we have looked at the complex process that's involved in cell division. We may ask ourselves, uh, in cell division, of course, we're looking at cell growth, cell replication, and so on and so on. Most of the impetus that has driven the research in cell division 
and the control of this process is really the effort that we have made in trying to understand cancer. You ask the question, what does cancer have to do with cell division? But the reality, folks, cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. So let's talk a little bit about cancer. All of us are, are familiar, of course, with the uh, uh, with cancer since uh, it probably uh, affects one out of three of, of all of us, okay? Uh, so let's look at the characteristics of cancer and try to understand how this relates to uh, cell growth and cell regulation. The reality is that all of us, at one time or another, during, during, during a given day, will have a cell that is undergoing uncontrolled growth, which means that if we don't stop that growth, that cell will become a tumor. Now, fortunately, we have the immune system, and the immune system will quickly recognize a cell that looks different and will grab it up and chew it up, and we're safe. Occasionally, our immune system fails us. The older we get, uh, the less the less opportunity the immune system has in catching uh, cells that become a little crazy. So let's look at the characteristics of cancer. First of all, as we said, cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. Normally, when you have a tissue injury, cells will grow. They will grow in a planar fashion. They won't just suddenly grow and form a gigantic tumor on your skin. Instead, what they'll do basically is form a nice pink layer, and everybody feels good about the whole process of healing. However, in cancer, the cells somehow fail to communicate. Instead, what happens is you get uncontrolled cell growth, which, of course, is no good because it leads to a variety of problems. Let's look at some of the problems that arise from uh, and some of the characteristics of cancer. Uh, cancer will metastasize. What do we mean by metastasize? A cell that has changed and lost its ability to control itself will leave the primary site and go someplace else and set up shop. For example, Someone that develops a tumor and the develops abnormal growth in the prostate, those cells can leave the prostate and end up in the brain. And in the brain, those cells will form a mass. So basically, you end up with a prostate tumor in the brain. Yes, that does happen, unfortunately. Or the cells may end up in the bone, causing bone tumor. So basically, in metastases, you have the migration from a primary site to a secondary site. In reality, it's not the primary tumor that kills most people, it's the secondary tumor that does away with an individual. Now, cancer cells are abnormal in appearance. We can recognize a cell by looking under the microscope, and we can see that the cell nucleus is larger. The cell may be may be may look uh, 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 quite different. And this is the way. And this is the way a pathologist will determine if a given biopsy is cancerous or not. Uh, during surgery, a piece of tissue is taken, sent to the laboratory. A trained pathologist will look at the tissue and make a, often a subjective analysis of the tissue and determine if it is malignant, quote, or not, and maybe even stage it. Only trained people can do a very good job at this. But the important point is that uh, cells are abnormal in a number of ways, and they can be, de and they can be detected uh, through microscopy and other uh, testing techniques. Third, uh, another important uh, characteristic of cancer is that cancer is under genetic control. Now, what we're saying is that every cell is controlled through a series of genes, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. In a normal cell that's healthy, 
the oncogene is going to be turned off and the tumor suppressor gene will be turned on. In a cell that becomes cancer, guess what happens? The process gets reversed. The gene that suppresses tumors is turned off and the gene that allows tumors to form the oncogene is turned on. Now this theory is, uh, has significant uh, legs to it and there's a lot of work around this process trying to uh, understand and control cancer. So basically, how does a tumor start? It's basically often instigated through a variety of carcinogens. Now carcinogen may be a virus, it may be a, it may be a chemical, it might be uh, a, an environmental uh, uh, energy source like uh, UV light and so on. So what basically happens is a cell gets exposed to a carcinogen and the carcinogen starts to screw around with the oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes. It turns one gene on, one gene off, and next thing you know it, you've got a, a growth that is absolutely unwanted. <laughs> <laughs>